Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Warwick F1 show. We have finished our penultimate triple header of the season and we are in the middle of this random lover break we get before Las Vegas. So we thought, hmm, maybe people don't know what we're going on about with some of the terms in F1 when they listen to the podcasts. Let's do a bit of a beginner's guide. So that's what this episode's going to be. It's going to go over some of the key historical races you might want to watch, some of the basic facts, and just any general other questions that people were considering that they don't know about. So today with me, I am your host, Catch, and we have Callum and Chinmay, who are regulars on the podcast, and we are joined today by special guest James. So hello, and thank you for being here. So the first question I want to get into is... Let's say that someone is watching F1. They have never, they haven't heard of the sport. They don't know what's going on. So, how would you all describe the sport to someone who is completely new to it? Uh, well, for me, I'd say uh, hello, everyone. I, I've been demoted from the host for this episode, so I'm uh, I'm I'm being reclaimed as a, as a speaker role. So, for F1, for me, I'd say that the way that I've always thought about F1 is, or the reason that it's maybe different from other racing series is that it's. It's it's really meant to be the pinnacle of, of race of, of engineering really when it when it comes to the development of the cars because you'll see a lot of other series and it will be uh, a spec series where all of the cars are exactly the same and it's purely down to the level of the driver and that's not saying those racing series are bad but what F one F one really heavily focuses on the the development side of the cars and who can really. When a new set of rules comes out, which it does every so often, we've got a lead up to one now coming out in the 2026 season. It's about what team can identify how to best make those rules work for their own car. And that means that their car is fastest on track. And that means that the drivers that they have in those cars have the best chance of, of winning the races and eventually the championship. So I think that's what really sets apart F1 for me from the other racing series it's really uh, a focus on that, that can be a bad thing sometimes as obviously money comes into it a lot and that's why we've seen developments throughout the recent years like the uh, which we might talk about later like the cost cap for example which limits the amount of money that teams can spend in certain areas but i think that's certainly something that f1 stays true to of its roots compared to some other racing series say like nascar or indycar things like that is it being the 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 frontier of, of of engineering and new ways to develop to develop technology ultimately, which is what it is and always has been really. That is the most succinct definition I've ever seen. That is such this labor is terms. Very, I love uh, it. This is very different from your definition. Yeah. Which is, yeah. We'll go into that afterwards. So Chinmay, do you have a counter definition? Oh well much bigger simplification. I call it the Premier League of racing. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the top it's if the, anyone's coming from football then that's yes. a perfect analogy. You know it's the best drivers, the best engineers, the best cars, doing the best racing. Well, theoretically the best. <laughs> theoretically <laughs> no, the best racing, yeah. yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, James, how would you well, describe it? Well, it's ultimately 20 drivers from 10 different teams, each with different cars, all competing to win races, and they get points based on where they finish in each race, and ultimately comes to an overall championship I, I like that. To win the two champions, the, the drivers' championship and the teams' championship, and it's a combination, best combination of driver and car wins. I, I think that's wins. what we've all gone for, really. Is, it, is it's uh, it's many elements, as as we know, yeah. fr- many elements coming together at once. The drivers, the teams, the people back at the factory to try and produce the best performance possible, and 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 that's why it affects so many people around the world. Ultimately, I think. Yeah. Definitely. And my, my one, I always simply, <laughs> whenever people ask me what F1 is and why they should watch it, I just say it's cars go vroom vroom around in funky circles. It's, the worst definition it's an incredible I've definition. From, from, from F1. It's especially, amazing. Especially whereas we're meant to be explaining things well to people on a beginner's episode. Yeah, cars go vroom vroom in funky circles. Sure, we can go into the technicals of there's different championships and different points, that's fine. But. In this simplistic form. Let us know in the com- We can do a poll in the comments below. Who, whose who, definition, whose do definition do you prefer? Whose definition do you prefer? We'll see you get some out yeah. of that and get back to you on that. Okay, fine, sure. So now we know, now we've described what F1 actually is. Why? I want a brief answer from everyone because I think when people get into F1, there's so many different reasons. Maybe it's family, maybe it's a good race that you've watched randomly and you decide, oh yeah, I'm going to carry on watching this sport. So. Briefly, why did you guys get into F1? Um, mine, I think, was probably from my dad, to be honest. I think he was maybe 
uh, a, a vague watcher of, F, of of Formula One, and I got into it around I think 2010 to 2011. My my earliest memories are of liking Jensen Button at McLaren. I, I remember going into a, to get like a, like the toy models of the cars, and specifically wanting Jensen Button's uh, the the Chrome McLaren, and. And then recently in 2018 was when I first probably started getting back into it and actually watching all the races. So I'd say that would be my 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 earliest memories and then my uh, my resurgence into watching F1 in 2018 over over the past six seasons. Yeah, for me it was from Top Gear actually because uh, I grew up watching Top Gear much younger and so like I always remember especially Clarkson going on about Formula One and. They see that they get like the F1 drivers come around to do the lap around the track and that sort of stuff, and to be fair, I think it was I watched that's when I think it was the first interview I ever watched ended up becoming my favorite driver of all time, Kimi Raikkonen, and I just like it was like the most awkward interview of all time, but it was so funny. I found it so funny at the same time. I just and and I think the first race I actually watched was Belgium 2012 when Maldonado jump started and there's oh absolute God. chaos. Iconic we, one. We recommend that if you have a spare 10 minutes on your hand, just looking up a Kimi Raikkonen compilation. Actually, it won't even be 10 minutes long. If you get two minutes. Just in, the, just in the amount that he speaks. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, he's, he's certainly a, a favourite driver to many. Definitely. Yeah. James? Well, I started getting into it. I'm not quite sure exactly what got me into it. I don't know. It was kind of the later end of, latter end of 2015 season, which wasn't exactly the greatest season ever. But... I don't know, stuff like reading around BBC Sport and thought it seemed quite interesting. It was around Sochi time, US. I don't know, that started getting me into it from about then. And then I started to start watching every race from 2016. That's a pretty good season to start watching, I can't okay. lie. Yeah. I'm a bit first race I've watched live. But first race I've watched live, I got up for 5 a.m. to watch Australia 2016. It was actually quite a good race. Respect. 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 I was speaking to it as a society's fan. I would not get up at 5 a.m. now. Yeah, got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like 2021 and expecting this is what, this is how good F1 gets. <laughs> yeah, which is frustrating. Mine was, uh, I watched it a little bit with my dad when it was on BBC Live, um, when it was free there in like 08, 09. I don't have any like actual memories of it, but I know that I did watch it with my dad, then stopped watching it and got into it again in 2019, midway through the season. So I think COVID definitely helped out with all the Twitch streams. I loved watching them and that really got me into the drivers. So I think that's what properly got me into the sport again, um, late 2019. People were certainly looking for, for stuff. Oh, 100%. Long time to occupy themselves. And so Formula One clearly provided a, a bit of an answer there. It did, and it was a good answer. So, yeah, those are some of the reasons why you might get into it. Hopefully, this episode, if you're listening to it, you either haven't watched races or you've watched a few, but you actually don't know fully what's going on. So we did actually ask the members on Instagram some questions, so we're going to dot them throughout about what are some facts that you do really want to know, whether they be technical or whether they be more general. So I think while we're talking about the past, let's go to one of the first questions that came through which is, what are some of the most important historical races to watch? Because, obviously, the new season, this season is amazing, and the most recent seasons have been a bit more dry, to say the least, with Max and Red Bull being a bit dominant. So, if you want to go back and watch some of the older races, what are some that people should keep their eye out for? So... I think the one that always springs to mind for me is Germany 2019. That's probably the first absolutely absolute classic race that I watched live that's probably why it sticks close in my mind and the reason for that is it was a very it was a wet race uh, a lot of heavy rain fall throughout and a lot of changing conditions we'll talk about this I think later in the episode but usually the formula is that if you have to put no pun intended the formula is is that you have <laughs> if you have if there's rain coming down then chances are it's going to be a pretty good race because it's a lot harder for the drivers to stay on track and to put good lap times is so so typically there's a lot more a lot more action, a lot more chaos and, and unpredictable events as, as part of the race. And this basically sums up Germany 2019 in a nutshell where I think everyone, I've said on this podcast before, everyone and their nan went off at some <laughs> point in the race. A lot, lots of people, of people crashing out and uh, a, a lot of back and forth with, safe, with safety cars and, and stoppages of the race. And that's one that sticks in my mind. And then any others, I'd say j- a lot from the 2021 season, as I'm sure we're all thinking. Yes, really. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Should we? I was going to say a lot of, especially recently, a lot of races from Brazil. So yes. I think in Brazil 2007 and 8, um, Brazil 2010, 2012, uh, 
2019, 2021. So just Brazil. Just just yeah. go back and watch every yeah. Brazil race. Honestly, Brazil, Brazil is a very good. I think it's yeah. it's one of the yeah. track that really de- yeah. delivers most, isn't it? Consistently, oh, yes. yeah. exactly. Yeah, James, you have a favourite. So I've got one particular favourite. Obviously, those make a races 2021 races like yeah. Silverstone with the controversy with Hamilton and Verstappen colliding on Honda Shock win in Hungary. Yeah. Yep. A week later, or a week or two later, then races like Monza and Sochi that year as well. Yeah, there was so many good ones in that Going season. Back further, good races. Like, or some of the title deciders further back, it's like something like Brazil 20 trail. Yes, that's what I've got my list. Spain 2016, remember Stappen won on his debut for Red Bull. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think some 2016 ones were also good. Like, I. I always liked, when I was getting into F1, I wanted to watch some of the more historical ones. And honestly, going back to the year of the 80s, I loved watching the 80s races. Like, that commentary and the videography is actually, sure the quality's worse, but sometimes it was more dramatic, which made it better. The old engine sounds Suzuka, as well. I know. Suzuka 89. Oh, yeah. Australia 86. Yes, yeah. that's another good one. Re-ray title, another, Re-ray another Re-ray Brazil. title designer. Yeah, yeah Brazil Mansell 88. Yeah. yeah. We should also mention that if, um, uh, talk, on, on the topic of the 2021 season, it, it's a long. it's been a long known fact for the past three years that if, if you're new to F1, you do not mention Abu Dhabi 2021. Yes, because, that's a fun fact. Because, don't do yeah, it. Fun, don't, just don't do that. Whatever, any conversations you're having, don't bring it up unless you, you want uh, like an hour long debate. It was a very very controversial end to an amazing season uh, an amazing season and very still very controversial of, of uh well there was obviously we all know that it was some, some wrongdoings of going on but of uh, of what driver probably should have won the championship and it's it's never really come to any sort of finalized conclusion just a lot of people having their opinions so uh word of warning from <laughs> from from Official word of warning from the Warwick F1 show, don't bring up Abu Dhabi 2021. Yeah, I would just keep anyone. it muted on all your social media. <laughs> just get rid of it. We'll talk about it when, when it's all calmed down and we've kind of forgotten about it. In like so in a decade time, time. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not one to have a conversation about. But okay, so those are definitely some good historical races. We've also got a lot of the recent ones because we are lucky with how the races are this season in 2021, 20, sorry. So yeah. Okay, so we, as kind of mentioned before, a lot of these races are very good because of the weather conditions. So one thing to question is why weather conditions make such good races and how does it impact like car setup and strategy? So I think resident engineer Shimei <laughs> should start us off with this. <laughs> Jim, Jim so, yes. Yeah, so I'll, tr- I'll go as, I won't go as too technical on this, but effectively, Standard tyres in F1, they're what they call slicks. So you, if you look at your standard road car tyres, you, you see like treads and that sort of stuff. F1 cars generally don't really have those treads. And those sort of tyres are not designed to work in wet conditions where the grip is a lot less and the tyre track is a lot cooler. So and that's what it is. So generally, and the thing is F1 cars are generally all designed to work in the dry and that sort of stuff. As soon as the track gets wet, there's a lot less grip on the track because of the water. If if any of you drive, you know, if you know what I'm talking about, like, it's a lot, it's a lot easier to like spin out control that sort of stuff, and then drivers have to have special intermediate or full wet tires. So, intermediate intermediates are kind of just like more for damp tracks and that sort of stuff, or light rain. Full wets for if it's absolutely chucking it down, and they're designed. Their tires are designed to work in those sort of really wet conditions and that sort of stuff, and. Because of the how fragile the F one cars and how easy how difficult it is to drive, you know, in the in the dry condition in optimal running conditions alone, these are ridiculously difficult cars to run. I mean, these cars don't have power lock power steering, for example. So, like you know, they don't have anti lock brakes braking systems or anything like that. So, and they literally all depend on aerodynamics. And so, generally in the rain. Aerodynamics because you're gonna go slower is much more difficult to control the car. They don't have traction control either, for example, and all rear wheel drive. So and so it separates is and because it differs your strategy. So when you put on certain tires, because different tires will be different, fast in different conditions, and also the skill of the driver. Because in the rain is when you really see the skill, the skills of the top drivers. Yeah. And if like you're looking at as recent as the last race in Brazil, 
where you know you saw the difference between the best of the best with Max Verstappen coming from 17th to first and certain drivers that even though he has been even though I think this was more of a blip because he is actually not that he's actually fairly decent in the wet but not as you just we don't need to mention that no, <laughs> but you, 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 we don't need you, to mention that sorry but it's a lack of experience and the lack to be honest but like yeah yeah, that's that's why and because it's so, because these cars are so difficult to control. Yeah. Usually, you'll find when we do predictions on on this podcast, for example, uh, and and previewing the different races as, as they come along, you'll often find that when it comes to a wet race, will favour the drivers with more experience, and that's because they just have they well have more experience in in handling the car in these wet conditions, and so they know exactly when they can put the power down to get the the, the most uh, performance out of their car without spinning out or causing an accident or things like that. And this is exactly why the the most recent wet race we had, which was in Brazil, the final race of our recent triple header, we saw drivers like Verstappen who have that experience do so well uh, compared compared to some of the other other rookies that were that were on on the track at that time yeah well the other thing when it's wet is also well conditions changing a lot it changes the order so people who don't normally do so well might suddenly come nearer the front and people who normally do well might suddenly find themselves struggling and then as conditions change performance different drivers might suddenly speed up or slow down and then there's the intermediate then if once it gets to above a certain amount of wet Wait, water on the track you switched intermediate tires which are much better and even wetter wet tires although no one's really seems yeah to apparently the wet tires don't exist according to Pirelli but it is they do exist but no one seems to ever use them but yeah because they always that cancel it creates before. extra intrigue like whether people go into pit and the thing is if you get it wrong you can even by one lap you can gain or lose like so much time that's such a good point when yeah because like, the race strategy is yeah particularly if it's going from dry to wet you can do like 20 yeah. seconds a uh, lap if by pitting at the wrong time. Yeah, Even exactly. Wet to dry, you can gain a lot, but not as much. Yeah, the the not dry to wet way round does create crazy strategies that we can see, and it really throws up just it shows up chaos in every race. So that's why they are the wet races and wet conditions do they have such an impact, and that's why we do like seeing it as F1 fans because whenever we know that a weekend is going to be wet at some point, we know that there'll be a bit of chaos. We know that it'll be interesting. And, and also, the teams have have kind of less t- when when the, ch- the conditions are so changing, the teams don't know what to expect, and so you see a lot more teams making decisions on the fly because the way that the, the, the way that a normal weekend is structured will, will will not include sprints, which we might go on to explain a little bit later, is that the the teams have three. Uh, practice sessions in order to gain as much data on on the car and the layout of the track in the certain and, and obviously normally that will be conducted in, in the in the dry but then if say we might have a session cancelled because of the weather one of those practice sessions cancelled because of the weather or we might have the the practices done in the dry but then the race it comes and it's it's raining and so this means that the, the teams don't know what to expect more not only from the the conditions and how the track will respond but also how their own car responds in these conditions and that means that you might see what is uh, the, the normal kind of performance order in the cars changed up quite a bit when it comes to the race and that's why as F1 fans we love to see it so much because it's it's a lot more unexpected compared to what you'd get in a dry race you could argue. Yeah and that I think brings us nicely on to another question that one of the members sent in which was what is actually the difference between the different tyres which is a question I think a lot of people ask because there are three compounds of tyres mainly there's the soft the medium and the hard uh, Pirelli, which is the tyre manufacturer, could choose between six different sets, six different options. Um, and it's all about the grip and the durability. So if we have a soft tyre, for example, which has the red stripe around the outside, it means that technically the cars could go faster. In very layman's terms, the cars can go faster. They have less durability, but kind of more grip in a way. Uh, but with the hard tyres, they can go on a lot longer, but the grip is a lot less and the cars end up being a lot slower. So that is very layman's terms of why there's different compounds of tyres and that how that impacts strategy. So uh, Yeah, I think we're also, got, we, we're also going to mention, you mentioned that there were the, the, the six different tyre compounds. So the way that the way that each race weekend works is, we used to, if you, if you go back to, to watch any highlights from say 2018, for example, you'll find that there are a lot more, a lot different colours 
And this is basically what Catch was explaining, but there's a lot greater, uh, greater a range of them going from ultra soft to, to hard, where, for, again, for the ultra softs, it's, it's the duration's really short, but they have maximum performance out of them. And then for the hards, they have uh, more duration, but less performance. And we still have that. However, the Pirelli will essentially just choose uh, three different compounds to bring to a track, and whichever one of those is the least durable, they'll call the soft tire. Whichever one uh, is, is in the middle will be the medium, and whichever one is the most durable, they'll call the hard. So even though, just to give a bit more information, even though each race is soft, medium, and hard, they'll actually vary the different compounds um, that they bring to each race, and that is what C1, C2, and C3 is. I feel like I'm going into way too much detail than I need to, but... <laughs> no, it's yeah. a good explanation, yeah, yes, yeah. completely. Uh, James, do you have anything to add? Uh, not really, so yes, yeah, so basically the soft tyre is the fast, so on the so when they start, when the tyre's new, the soft tyre is the fastest, followed by the medium, and then the hard, but as they wear down the the soft gets, they all get slow as the stint goes on, but the soft gets slower at the quickest rate and gets slower most in the fewest, well, the medium doesn't degrade as much and the hard even less. So over time, so as you go further into the race, the harder compounds become faster once they've been on for more than a certain amount of time. Yeah. A graph and would be quite nice to illustrate it, always but we can't really share it on a podcast. Pardon? A graph would be quite good to illustrate it, but we yeah, can't Yeah, really it would, but sadly... <laughs> if, we were on a, if we were on a video, we could do that, but yeah. we're in a radio station. Yeah, in every, ra in every race, apart from wet conditions, this is all excluding wet. If it's wet, this rule doesn't apply, but in every race... The teams and drivers have to have two compounds of tyres. So they, if you start on a soft tyre, you can't just have a soft tyre for the whole race. You have to go onto a medium or a hard. And I think that's where the strategy is so interesting. And why people are asking Pirelli, to, which is the tyre manufacturer, to create more of a difference between the tyre compounds. Because sure, the soft can degrade a lot faster than the hard tyre. But it, the performance is still so good with both tyres that a lot of teams end up doing the same strategies. So it gets a bit boring. Which yeah. is great for the teams and the drivers because they can predict it and sure, from an engineering side, that's amazing. But for a fan point of view, yeah. it's a bit boring. Welcome to the environment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, um, yeah, it, it definitely, we definitely want to see some more strategy calls being introduced. And often you'll find that some really exciting races from the past are, are races where the situation demands that, that a driver has to do maybe more than one pit stop, which they typically typically would. So maybe maybe three or even four stops. And perhaps because of weather conditions, changing weather conditions, or because of uh, different incidents on the track. But certainly, I think what all this demand from Pirelli is, is, is just wanting to see some different strategies and, and the, the teams having a, a, a more of a, a variety of, of strategies throughout, throughout a race. Yeah, I think that's pretty well described. So I want to go on to another question, which is a bit more of a technical one. So someone has asked, which is a very good question, to be honest, because it's something none of us really know at the start. What does ERS and DRS mean? Because these are just random letters that are put mm. together. And Crofty on Sky and all the other commentators, they mentioned these terms, but we don't really know what actually they are. So, resident engineer, did they? I'll do DRS first, because that's a lot easier to understand. Um, it's not, if those of you who watch cricket, it is not a decision review system or anything <laughs> like that sort of stuff. It's not another sport. It's, it's the same acronym. It's called the drag reduction system. So if you have watched an F1 race, uh, you'll notice sometimes, like the like, start finish straight, you see a little flap up in the back. Yeah. All that effectively means that you can go faster in a straight line. Yeah. So, so why can you go faster in a straight line? Yeah, because that's why it's called the drag reduction system. So it basically reduces drag. It means you, you're not. The air is not pushing you back as fast, and you can go faster effectively. The whole idea is is that it allows for cars behind to catch up to the car in front of it much more easier uh, to make more overtakes happen. Sometimes it does create a lot of over really nice overtaking. Sometimes it just makes it really easy. But then again, it's a it's a sort of a marmite thing. You either love it or you hate it. And I'm personally I'm a fan of it, but. Yeah, yeah, I think probably for if, if you're listening yeah. to this and didn't know what DRS was before, you're probably thinking, hmm, that seems a bit of an unfair advantage to the car behind. And and that is true, and that is a lot one of the arguments against DRS of, of, of it being brought in. Um, the, the, tr the truth is that the reason it was originally brought in is because it's actually difficult 
for a car to follow. Uh, I don't want to go into too much of the details, but because of the because of the wake of the air coming off of the, of the car in front, uh, a chasing car will will find it harder to, to navigate the circuit and to and to keep up the pace in their car compared to their car in front. So DRS was. Uh, uh, brought in as a sort of a measure to reduce that and I think gradually the FIA have been starting to try and reduce its effects over recent years so that we get back to what I guess you could say is, is actual pure racing rather than DRS which is a bit more artificial but the truth is it's the best we've got at the moment and that's kind of everyone's argument for DRS. I'd yep. say. Are you a fan of it James? Well I think it's necessary because the thing is overtaking is very difficult. Not only are you slowed down by the dirty air running behind, but also to get past them, you've got to physically be quick enough for you to get your car pretty much on a, a long side and a head, head of the other car in a place where there's space to do it and there's a good enough, you've got a good enough line to do it. So obviously you need quite an advantage for that. And without DRS, it would be extremely difficult to overtake. I mean, to kind of see races and people just stuck in position and not much happening. Yeah, especially if there's not a lot of DRS zones or if the tracks are too thin so the cars can't overtake. That's why DRS is kind of important. It's still... We have to reduce the dirty air within the car. I'm saying we. F1 has to reduce the dirty air that's produced by cars. Contrary to what we believe, we are not in a position of power in F1, unfortunately. I wish. When the if F1, only. If the FIA are listening, which they are, hello FIA, please uh, make the cars have less drag, thank you. But, yes, so... That is DRS. There's another one, ERS. E yes. it, this actually took me like a year and a half after watching to properly <laughs> get what this was. It's a weird concept. So yeah, okay. So it does stand for the Energy Recovery System. It's been around in different forms in Formula 1 since around 2009. Um, uh, introduced as, well, it was called KERS then. Because it was called the Kinetic Energy Recovery System. But now it's just Energy Recovery because now... Because what it all it effectively is, it's because it's a hybrid. It effectively means that all the engines that they use in F one are hybrids, like I don't know a Toyota Prius or you know that sort of stuff. But obviously, the the idea is not to save, uh, you know, save the environment. It's more to create, make the engines more efficient and become even more powerful. So, uh, if any of you has seen the sort of if anyone has watched Top Gear and watched the McLaren P1 road test, Clarkson does a really good uh, answer to that as well. So, yeah. So, effectively, what it does, it catches energy that's sort of, like, wasted in the engine. So, whether that's engine heat or braking or energy, the energy that's hard, that you release when you're, like, braking, for example, because what you're doing is you're it's releasing, connect, turning kinetic energy, so movement, into heat. So, what the idea is that... The end. The engine sort of captures that energy, and then it can store it in a battery, and then it can use it again as sort of electrical power to basically use as more power. Basically, make the car more powerful. So that's why I say is increasing the energy, making less waste. And, and that's yeah. our first physics lesson on the <laughs> yeah. F one show, indeed. But but it is obviously true, and it's and and yeah. Chime do definitely um, explained it a lot better than I could. And it and it is. Certainly, I think one of the reasons why the new generations of F1 cars are uh, a hell of a lot quicker compared to some, some of the cars that we've had in previous years because they have essentially another source of power other than the internal combustion engine. And it's, it's as we mentioned, it's been a big part of the, of the manufacturing and development of these cars for, for years now, I'd say. Yeah. Completely. And I think, yeah, I don't really have much else to add as I'm not an engineer, <laughs> but... It is, I started understanding it more watching other series, so watching IndyCar with their push to pass, I think that's obviously not the same as ERS, but it kind of helped me, watching that um, just helped me understand what ERS was in the context of F1. So if you are confused, I would recommend watching other series and just seeing um, how they use it. Same with Formula E as well, they have a similar-ish system. Um, so yeah. Uh, I want to jump onto a, a fun uh, question sent in by a member, which was, why is Max so good? That Why is, is that he is so the good? Question. Exactly. I think what I want to go into, and I, what I want an answer from all of you, is what do you think is a more important factor in uh, Formula One? Is it the car or is it the driver? What is more important, James? I think the car is overall more important because you see a top driver in a rubbish car still can't be anywhere near the front. I mean, look at Alonso. 
in the Aston Martin. It's, he's a top driver, but the car is really not up there. And he's at most in the midfield. It was even worse when he was at McLaren. He was like stuck at the back, even though, even though he's one of the top drivers. Well, in contrast, in Cena's, that's why it's so big when a driver moves up to a top team, because he's got a chance to do well. I mean, because it was when Leclerc jumped up from a, in a Sauber to in a Ferrari, he jumped from like fighting for points to fighting for wins. And even a bad, even a bad, even a not brilliant driver in a good car still gets good results. I mean, even a solid midfield driver, someone who's probably in the middle of the past, say Bottas, but still winning plenty of races when he was at Mercedes. I do think I don't think it's as important as it was a few years ago. Because I mean, just look at the gap between Verstappen and Perez now. Perez is in the Red Bull <laughs> yet he can't even get in the top five anymore. Yeah, I'm sure if you go back to well, pretty much before COVID, it was yep. Diff- it was like only ever Mercedes, Ferrari, and Red Bull getting anywhere near the podium. It was. We had the Hambot Ver as the iconic trio <laughs> on the podium yeah. all the time. Should we? No, I agree. It's- is a bit more focused on the driver because they degrade the grid is so much closer now. Because especially in some race weekends recently, we've been seeing as much as four teams actually fighting for the win with you not know, McLaren, Ferrari. When I say Red Bull, I mean Verstappen and and Mercedes, you know. And then, but then even especially like you know, like you said, if you don't have the car, you can't win races. Like you know, I mean. Look, I mean, look at I don't know. Okay, even look at Lando Norris for example. Like, we know Norris is a brilliant driver. But it wasn't until the fact that the car was actually competitive enough since, what, June last year that he's been able to fight wins. We, we've known for years now he's a fantastic driver. But, you know, 2018, 2019, when he first joined the sport... 2019? Huh? 2019? No, no, when he was approaching the sport. Oh, like, we, okay. no, no, we, no, we all knew how good... Because, obviously, his rookie year in F2 was... He, you know, he came second that rookie year. Obviously, Russell won, but... And that sort... Um, 2019, 2020, the car was a midfield car. You know, if you're pushing to the podium places, you're a fantastic driver. But now, you know, same driver. Okay, yeah, okay, he's more experienced, but then the car's even better, and now he's fighting for the wins. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I do certainly agree with that. And this kind of comes back to the point that I was, I was mentioning on the money side of things and the, and the development and being at the forefront of engineering. And I suppose you could see it a little bit as a downside of F1 as well, the fact that money unfortunately does play a huge part in the sport and and the the teams with the most money i.e the works teams of mercedes and mclaren and ferrari these will typically be at the at the front for race wins not necessarily because they have the best drivers but because they can pour so much more money into their cars and divert their cars really to the best that they absolutely can compared to the lower down teams like Haas and salba and and so from that from that perspective i think i i definitely agree with with james and chimmy and that the, the, you you have to get the car right first it doesn't matter what driver you have i mean mercedes currently have uh, a seven-time world champion at the wheel and they and hamilton has only been able to get a couple of wins this season because the mercedes car has not been on it for a lot of races and this was certainly the case as well for the past few seasons when the mercedes car was arguably worse so that is the reason. I'd also like to quickly bring up a point, not as a beginner's guide to F1, but as a beginner's guide to the Warwick F1 show. We basically just slag off Sergio Perez <laughs> a lot. Like we don't, we don't mean to. So he's not he's, doing great at the moment. He's not doing great. For 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 context, he's he's he is partnered with with a uh, an incredible driver, one of the best drivers arguably of all time, in Max Verstappen, but. His performances have not been good recently, and we do keep bringing it up because it is a talking point for every race. In fairness, because he doesn't he doesn't really catch a break. But yeah, just just so you're aware, if you haven't listened to this podcast before. Yep. So let's go on to another one. We're going to play a fun game of how well do you know your F1 flags? So there are so many flags that are shown in the sport throughout a race weekend. So I think we should go around. Name the flag and what its purpose is. Shall I adjudicate because I've already looked up an image of all the flags on my phone? Boo! (laughs) Okay, boo! (laughs) So, okay, the first one I'm going to go with is the blue flag. It's quite a regular one. It is for drivers that are a bit slower, that need to be lapped. So in a Grand Prix, if there is a faster car behind, a blue flag will be shown to the slow driver that has to then move out the way and let the fast car through. So, that is the blue flag. James? Yeah, just, yeah. 
Which one do you want me to do? Name a flag. You can pick one. I just to add on the blue flag, it's also used in qualifying if someone out someone's on a fast lap and someone else is not on it, is just like warming up for a lap or just finish the lap to them to get out the way. I'll go next to the yellow flag. Famous one. So it means there's a means there's a hazard ahead and you have to slow down. And if there's a double waved yellow flag and you're not allowed to overtake, and a double waved yellow flag is means you have to slow down even more and be prepared to stop. Love and it. if it's qualifying your lap won't count. Yep. Jimbo, flag. Well, the green flag, just race. <laughs> just go, go for them. It's clear track, it just means conditions are clear, normal race rules apply. Yeah, hmm. yeah it's normally after a hazard, it means that hazard's yes. over. Yep. I'll then jump to the opposite of that, of the red flag, which is everyone stop driving, everyone who is on track has to go back to the pits. It is, there is something dangerous on track, there's a hazard, a severe hazard, or bad conditions. Just basically, it's not safe for the drivers to be out, therefore... <coughs> Flag, red flag means do not drive, go back to your pits. Right, we'll go around again, James. We're getting harder now. Okay, we? well, the checkered flag is obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting okay, yes. means... <laughs> You deserve that. Yeah, do the last of the, ma- last of the main flags. The checkered flag means the end of this race or the session. So it's waved at the end of the race. It's black and white checkers, a bit like a chessboard. It's obviously quite iconic. At the end of yeah. the race, it means the race is over. In practice or qualifying, it means you can finish your lap, and then after that, you have to come into the pits at the end of the following lap. Yep. So, flag, Jimmy. Oh, I want to go for the red and yellow stripe flag, Ooh. which means taking a difficult one there. No, it literally just means it's like very slippery conditions. To so say if it's like an oil spill for something like that, that's when they generally show it. I did have to remind myself of what that was a couple of weeks ago, mm. because but then it's, it's yeah. the one that's least used, I'd say. As, as one no, of there is ones. one that you don't see that as often. I'll mention later. I'm not sure I've ever seen them use the red and yellow flag, but mm. maybe they don't mm. make a point of it. I think it might have been in Brazil 2012. Did they have it when we had the viewing? I think that was maybe the only time. I, I'm not too sure <laughs> about that. I remember. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go black flag. Another solid coloured flag of driver uh, is disqualified. Such and we barely ever see it, but it did actually happen last weekend with Nico Hulkenberg. So it basically is just the driver. First time in seventeen ye- over seventeen years it had yeah. actually used. That's crazy. That might be longer than some of the listeners have been alive. So that's a scary thought. <laughs> <laughs> but here I'm we going are. Just over that question. <laughs> there we are. Um, yeah. Okay. Black flag. James, do you know any more? Um, yes, we'll go with the white flag. White flag means there's a slow-moving car or uh, there's some other kind of slow-moving vehicle on track. It's just warning, so either a car is some kind of problem like a puncture or maybe some other vehicle, or there'll probably be a safety guard there's some kind of other vehicle nowadays, but like a tractor crane or something. But yep. it's not if there's a uh, driver's got a problem and they're going slowly. I don't think it necessarily means you have to slow down. It just means be careful, warning. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I actually took the one I was going to take, but I do have one more. I had one more as well, the black and orange flag, or as some people in F1 like to call it, the meatball flag. Yep, the meatball flag, the meatball flag. So, I yeah, heard of it, I, think, it yeah, I remember it was shown to Kevin Magnussen a couple of years ago, I believe in Canada, um, or something like that. It was a North American race. Um, and basically what it means, it means that you you have a mechanical issue on the car that is hazardous for everyone else on the track, and you've got to go into pits and repair it, so... Maybe if you have like a if you're running around with like a front wing that's broken and is looking like things are popping off all the time, you had to go and get it replaced. They'll show that flag to you, or you know if there's like a massive gaping hole. Or like, basically, if you're gonna if if you got a mechanical issue or physical issue with the car, you're gonna be in hazard to everyone else on the track. You had to go in the pits. They'll show that when they show that flag. Perfect. What flags have we missed? There's one black other and black white and white flag. flag. I don't know what that flag is, so... It's basically a warning flag if you're doing something wrong. So it's not a penalty, but they're just warning you, stop doing what you're doing, and it comes with the driver number. And they use it when someone's had three track limits warning. So you're in the race, you're allowed... If you go off the track in the race, if you do it three times, you get a black and white flag, which is a warning, don't do it again. And the fourth time, you'll get a five-second penalty. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, that is all of the main flags that we have covered. So... What other questions do you think are very basic for people to maybe question when they watch the sport? What facts might not they know that you want to go over? Uh, have you mentioned the cost cap? 
we mentioned it briefly, but do you want to just explain what the cost cap is? Because it is discussed quite a lot. Yeah, so it's mainly been a thing since 2022, um, where nowadays all the teams have an actual financial budget that they have to deal to every single year. I don't know what the limit is now because they've been decreasing every single year since, so maybe it's like $135 million or something like that. Um, so if that's for the whole year, so this includes any car development, uh, all the personnel salaries other than the top three personnel, so maybe like the drivers and the top three sort of personnel, like the team principal yeah. and that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't think some marketing's involved in it, but anything related to the car, so that includes like the following year's upgrades because generally when you create, say like if you're making a car in a season, you normally say from like after the summer break in like September, you start looking at building next year's car. Or in the special case when there's new regulations, when there's a complete design overhaul, they'll be looking that they'll spend a lot of the year before looking at the brand new regulations, which they're going to be doing from next year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, because before, you know, you had like the big, big guns like, you know, Mercedes and Ferrari spending as much as $400 million a year. And they're like, so like Williams are financially struggling, but struggled to even hit 100. So the gap was just so far, uh, yeah. so far, that you know, they decided to try and bring the level together. One of the best ways was to actually devise the cost cap to, uh, you know, limit teams' budgets. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, and I think and that's definitely the reason for it, is to try and give the, the smaller teams uh, a bit of contention. And I think it has maybe slightly worked we haven't really got yeah. a chance to see the full effect the feels definitely of closer yet. i mean, yes. used to have mercedes for a rebel pulling away from everyone else by miles just because they spent so much more uh, even now we got a bit of a gulf between mercedes for a rebel and mclaren and the rest still kind of two tiers but at least we've got four teams in the top tier rather than three but i think it is overall is a bit closer the field yeah I would say it's kind of worked in a way. There's still issues. Like, I know Williams have talked before that they're still struggling financially with stuff. Sure, they get a lot of sponsorship now, which is great, but they're not actually hitting the capital, which does show that there are issues. They're not spending as much as some of the big teams are still, and they're still struggling to generate that revenue. So I think more still has to be done to make it more financially... Um, viable for smaller teams I'm not saying smaller teams, teams that maybe don't have as much budget, but yes, I think that is a lot of the basics covered I think that's a good bit of a guide uh, I thank you all for listening thank you James, Chimmy and Callum for joining me on this podcast uh, I have been your host Catch and there will be some more episodes coming out soon so make sure to keep your eyes out on the YouTube and Spotify for when they get released so thank you for listening and have a good day.